God is good, amen? Amen. And he's in a good mood. <laughs> we need to remember that. We need to remember that. These ideas of this punitive, retributive, you know, just justice at all costs, Father, is not the image that Jesus gives us. You know, Jesus is the exact impression of the Father. That's what he says in Hebrews. He wasn't going out and kicking butt and taking names like we think the Father truly is. He's a good Father, and he is trustworthy. We're going to talk about a little bit about that tonight. My name is Michael Perrin. Welcome to A Couple New Faces. I want to thank Brent publicly for filling in for me last week, as always. Uh, to have confidence when you go away to entrust a ministry to someone uh, is a huge blessing. I just want to say thank you to Brent for that, man. Well done. Well done. Thank you. So Exchange Life, what is it? Exchange Life is a Christ-centered process. Read along with me. That delivers hope and support to anyone seeking a life free from the snares of sin, suffering, and pain. It's designed to help you exchange agreement with lies for trust in the truth of God's word by way of review for all of us. I hope I bore you to death if you are a returning person that we believe lies. As we believe a lie, we give influence to the liar. And instead of manifesting the truth about what God says about us, we manifest the lie. So the more you agree with lies, the more you then manifest those lies, and, the more, and it's this... This, this supernatural funneling is what I call it, this divine vortex. And we end up spinning ourselves into the bottom of this thing until we really can't even find our way out. The way you find your way out is through truth, is through the Word of God, the Bible itself, but the literal Word of God, your relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you have, if you have questions about that relationship, I would don't do not pass go. I mean, I want to talk to you before we even you even leave here tonight about what your relationship is like with the Lord, because He desires that with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be your friend. Amen. He doesn't want to be your judge. He wants to be the person that walks up alongside of you and says, "Come on, let's go ahead and walk down this path further." And as you do that with Him, day after day, hour after hour, you develop this history with God. And so you can look back on things and remember and testify to the goodness. Somebody in here knows exactly what I'm talking about. To the goodness of who Jesus is in your life. So that's why we're here at Exchange Life. There's four components. Corporate gathering, that's what we're doing here. There are breakout groups for men and women after this message. Generally, we take a topic. Usually, it's part of the manual, which is that third one, that you work through a manual with a person called the first responder. The manual is there to allow you the opportunity to go deeper into the truth. You can get a little bit more intricate about some of the nuances of your agreement with the lies, kind of how they work their way out, and process those with that person. But it's not the manual that sets you free. It's not these meetings that set you free. It's agreement with the truth that Jesus has set you free. Now it's a matter of just undoing those lies and walking out in that victory that he has for you. And then finally, hopefully you'll come back and you'll want to be a first responder. I know we've got a couple people that are going to be finishing up this week. And so we expect them to come back and be amazing for the kingdom of God. Amen. So this past weekend, you have probably heard on the news that there was an event that took place at the Allen Mall on Saturday afternoon. Uh, there was a shooter that went into that place, and uh, wickedness and evil was part of his existence. And he took the lives of some people. Uh, specifically, he took the lives of three of Preston Woods family members here at our church. Um, they are part of Preston Wood Christian Academy. They're part of then Preston Wood themselves. And just so that you understand where the truth is, you're going to hear a lot of stuff on the news and a lot of this and whatever. Uh, the mom and dad and youngest brother, their lives were taken, but William, who is the kindergartner here at PCA, uh, survived. He is you know, currently in the hospital, but they expect him to make a full recovery. His mom actually shielded him, and that's what prevented him from uh, being taken from us. And so this family needs our prayers, obviously. Uh, I'm going to selfishly ask that you would pray for the pastoral staff here at our church. 
we have CNN calling, we have Fox News calling, we have, it's just, you can imagine, with a situation like this that makes the national news, all of a sudden people want to know, well, what do, what do Christians really think about this stuff, especially as part of our community here at our church? But it's a broader community that reaches out wide. So in, in the lieu of that, I wanted to go back and, and kind of recycle a message that I gave two and a half years ago. I've added a couple new things to it, but I want to talk to all of us about this reality. I want to talk to us about exchanging fear. This is not part of the manual. This is kind of a one-off, and we do these on occasion when something warrants, I believe it warrants the necessity of kind of going off track and really examining and taking a specific look at something like this. Fear, what it is, how do we navigate it, what's the Word of God have to say about it? Because in the culture today, I have not experienced more fear than at any point in time. Uh, people say, well, it was worse in COVID. It was not worse at COVID. Uh, if this is, we are now experiencing the wave of what COVID has done for people and the fear that they're expressing, the anxiety, another word for it, anxiety, the depression, the loneliness, the, the regret, the remorse, all these other things. But the common root factor is a spirit of fear. What is fear? Fear is this. It's an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or, or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or is a threat. That is the literal definition of what fear is. I like to put it like this. Fear, ultimately, is an, an agreement against love. Specifically, fear influences the mind through these vain imaginations that create a hopeless outcome, regardless of the circumstance or the scenario. It's hopeless, uh, the, the, and that's obviously void of the Spirit of Christ. The Bible says it. And here it is. God will never give us a spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. That's 2 Timothy. The Bible clearly states that there is a spirit, there is an influence that attempts to guard you, to grab your heart and twist it off of the truth of what the Holy Spirit provides to you. What does the Holy Spirit provide to you? It's right here. Mighty power, love, and self-control. Literally, self-control can be translated as prudent and rational thought. Now, can I get a witness if you've ever met somebody who is in the throes and under the influence of fear? They are powerless. You with me? They don't believe that anyone can love them at that moment because of what they're going through. And prudent and rational thought is not something that do, they do well under the influence of fear. But we see that re repeated over and over again. I believe that fear is the most destructive influence affecting the world today, personally. I believe that. Um, I believe that a misunderstanding of Song of Solomon is what has affected culture the way it has. But I believe fear, the spirit of fear, is the most influential and damaging and destructive thing against the sons and daughters of God because it, it goes after everything. It destroys our authority, it destroys our ability to love, and it causes us to lose all sense of our identity and our value and worth to the Father because we feel worthless. We are under the oppression of fear. And it says it right there, self-control. No, I can't have any prudent and rational thoughts because my mind has been captured by something that the Bible says is a spirit. The spirit of wicked forces are here. The Bible reminds us of that. This guy that rolled into the Allen Mall, that is a powerful force of darkness. That is a lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. That's all that that is. People want to understand why. You will not understand why until you're willing to step into the realm of the supernatural and begin to understand why these things happen. It's demonic. Straight up, it's demonic. That is what chaos is all about, though. Chaos is an attempt to destroy our ability to, to love with confidence. Let me say that one more time. Chaos destroys our my ability to love with confidence. I might give you enough of my love, enough of my compassion, enough of my care, but I don't do that confidently because I'm still afraid of what you might do to me. You see how we withhold a little bit? But when we're confident in the love that the Father has for us, 
then we can engage in loving others well and with the confidence that God has for us. As I said, I wrote this a couple of years ago, this message, and in that message, I think it's applicable even today. I was praying, you know, COVID was going on. We had, this is 2020. We had no idea what was happening with this. And so I started praying one morning and I prayed this. I said, Lord, would you vanquish the disease from the globe? That's what I prayed. And I felt the spirit of God provoke me. And here's what he said. I wrote it down because I want to make sure I get it. This is what I, I believe the Lord spoke to me. He says, as you know, this disease is not from me. I'm not punishing the world. That was settled by my son, Jesus. However, I am using disease in order to vanquish the dis-ease in the hearts of my children. Start praying for the dis-ease of heart regarding my goodness and my kindness. Dis-ease. Dis-ease. At the outset, I want to make a statement about our emotions. And I want to make a statement that the topic of emotions, including fear, Jesus felt emotion deeply, in, including fear, as I mentioned before. He was tempted in every way that we are. Fear is not something to, to retreat back from. Fear is there to begin to ask the question, what am I filtering my emotions through? That's, that's the idea. To ignore or repress or dismiss our feelings is truly to fail to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. God gave us emotions. He gave us those emotions as a means with which we can communicate with him and sense his presence. I mean, I love feeling the pres feeling emotionally the presence of God. That is a wonderful thing. But we're not supposed to dismiss them. Fear, I'm just not going to fear anything. No, that's not it at all. God is trying to, listen, there are some things you should fear. Healthy fear. I distance myself from circumstances, if you know what I mean. I don't need to put myself in an environment that's going to ruin my life. Emotion cause, emotions cause disease that manifest in fear if those emotions are not filtered through truth. Feel what you want to feel. Have the emotions associated with whatever's going on, but make sure they're being filtered through, through truth. What does the Word of God say to us? There are four things, four primary sources that create dis-ease and create fear. And I'm just going to kind of chop these things off one at a time. There's the unexpected. The unexpected, uh, the recognition that evil things may happen and we are not in control. <coughs> Uh, neither is God, by the way, by his design. We can talk about that later. He has all authority. He has all command. But by his design, he has abdicated what we would, what I would call control of the situation. You with me? Yeah. Command, yes. Authority, yes. Who did he leave in charge? Thank you. Let's leave it at that. Inadequacy is the next one that creates disease and, and fear. You know, when you realize that what you possess is, when you imagine that what you possess is not enough. I mean, everybody has limitations to a point, but when you, when you think to yourself, I just don't know enough to get through this, that creates fear. Disapproval. When you are, become aware of the reality that you cannot please everyone all the time. And you are going to disappoint I, you know, I refereed soccer in my former days. I still do on occasion. And the best I can hope for is to have 50% of the fans think I made a good call. <laughs> I'm going to disappoint half, I, and I just know it. I mean, maybe if there's one that, you know, is aware of the truth of the game, that, oh, that was actually a good call. But the best I can hope for is 50-50. You are going to disappoint some people along the way. People are going to have opinions. They're going to have their idea for your life. Can I get a little amen for that? Amen. This is what you need to do. I pray to God. If you ever meet with me, I never say that to you. Because I am not Holy Spirit. No, I can give you guidance. I might be able to give you a little bit of wisdom. But rarely will I ever tell you this is what you need to do. And then disappointment. No matter how hard you try, it kind of leads right into it. You're, you are not perfect. But you are flawless. And that's the tension that we live in. The Bible never says that we're perfect. It says, as a matter of fact, if we want to get to heaven, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Guess what? 
It's not going to happen. He does say that we are flawless in his eyes, though. How is that? I'll let you wrestle with that later, okay? But dig into those things. I'm going to use the story of David. It's kind of one of those stories that, that has all things. King David, the, the, the second king of Israel, uh, as it were. And king David, the first one for the unexpected, this is what the Bible says about David. This is Saul speaking, and he says, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. Now, this is a request by Saul, who was then king at the time. And the request for David was to have him brought into Saul's, basically, castle, if you will, to his throne. Now, knowing a little bit of history, what would happen is when another, when a person was anointed king, that king would go out and would kill off the entire family that was represented so that there wouldn't be anybody left of that particular lineage or that particular line. The odds for David were not favorable at that moment. Send me David. I want to see him. To, for David not to go would have ensured his death. But the odds for David were not in his favor. David settled in his heart, that he, and he entrusted himself to the Lord and the promise of Yahweh. You see, David was already told he was going to be king by Samuel. And the word just hadn't gotten back to everybody, including Saul. Saul eventually realized that and tried to kill David, ultimately. But the odds, again, were not stacked in David's favor. When evil and wicked and, and terrible things happen, something happens that reveals where our heart is positioned. Do we respond in fear or do we respond with a quiet confidence of Yahweh that he has established in it? Because, you know, the unexpected things come. When you get that call from your manager at four o'clock on a Thursday and he needs you to come into his office Friday morning at nine. Where do you go? Oh, my gosh, this is my last day at my office, as opposed to I'm getting promoted. Everybody laughs at that one. Why is it so difficult to laugh at the second statement that I made? Because we want to default to fear. We don't want to be disappointed. You know, when the unexpected comes, we don't want to be disappointed. Um, I've, I've agreed with that lie over and over again. And I've, I've started, ba I used to base my life on percentages and odds. Yeah, I mean, recent studies have shown that the odds of you, X, Y, and Z, yeah, that's the unexpected. Because all of a sudden you formulate what, what we would call a fact based on man-made percentages and odds. God is against facts. He's all for truth, not a real big fan of facts. The truth is never at the mercy of facts and odds and percentages. The, the odds with God, you've heard me say this before, what are the odds with God? 100%. It either will or it will not happen. Who has a lot to do with that? Me. I'm the one that determines much of that 100%. I mean, what do I mean? The f facts. There is a fact that a virgin is incapable of having a baby. There is a fact that an army of 300 cannot defeat an army of 250,000. That's just a fact. I mean, let's not even go into odds and percentages. The percentages of a man, Abram, having a baby at the age of 100 a little bit older probably, they're like zero. That, that's the odds. That's why I said God is not all about facts. He's into truth, absolutely. Think of what they had to overcome if they built their life on facts, odds, and percentages. I mean, Mary, what does she have to overcome? Uh, it's never happened before in human history and will never happen again in human history, but it's gonna happen for me because God said so. What? to overcome the unexpected. That's the idea. There are moments in which, in order to have internal rest, we are gonna to have to need to live in the denial of the facts, the odds, and the percentages. Now, I say that not in a spirit of irresponsibility, okay? If you have a lump on your body that you don't know how you got it, you go to the doctor to find out what it's all about. You with me? You still rely on the Lord for the healing because ultimately he's the one that does that even through the hands of doctors and medicine. Okay? But 
we have to deny sometimes those, those facts, those odds, those percentages. And if you've ever walked through something like that, you understand exactly what I'm saying. I mean, the odds of some of you guys and ladies being here tonight, yeah, they were close to zero. I know some of your stories, close to zero. But God, but God, God just needs a little bit of walking in truth for him to be able to use it as 100%. So how do you exchange overcoming evil and stop using facts? Remember that the odds with God are 100%. 100%. Another one, inadequacy. We fall into fear because we feel like we're inadequate. We don't have the right tools. We don't have the right equipment. We don't have what it takes in order to be successful. The odds, the inadequacy, 1 Samuel 17, 38. Then Saul clothed David in his own tunic, put a bronze helmet on his head, and dressed him in his armor. David strapped his sword over the tunic to walk, but he was not accustomed to them. And he says, I cannot walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not accustomed to them. Accustomed to them. So David took them off. And when you imagine that you don't have enough or what you have isn't good enough, it's tempting to give in to methods that are common in their nature. Okay, I, don't, again, don't be irresponsible, but tapping into methods that are just common by their very nature. God gave you common sense. Heard that term before? Yeah, nothing about God is common. Matter of fact, if it's common, it, it probably isn't from him. He works in the realm of the uncommon. He works in the realm that, you know, he just simply makes statements and it's up to us as to whether or not we want to choose to agree with him. If I told you tonight, you, you came in here addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, addicted to porn, whatever it is, and I told you tonight that you could take your last first step right now where you're sitting, would you agree with that? Yes. Well, it's, it's no, that's uncommon. That's exactly why I'm, I'm, telling, it. I'm telling you that. I've tried it before. Uh -uh. No, God does uncommon things in our life because that's, that's where he is. The lie, common sense, is there. I mean, building an ark over the course of 80 years, uh, that's a little uncommon. It, it, you know what I mean? It's never been, nobody ever built a boat in the history of mankind, and yet we've got, you know, Jonah, go ahead and do that. Using trumpets, empty jars, and torches to defeat an enemy, no weapons, that's uncommon. Feeding 25,000 people with five loaves and two fish, that's pretty uncommon as well. Nothing that he offers is common, including you. You are, I'll use a biblical verse, you are a peculiar person. That's actually a compliment. Most people I'm offended by. No, the Bible says we are a peculiar people. That's what the Bible, why are we peculiar? We're peculiar because we don't follow the common sense of culture. We do things that are uncommon before the Lord. Fear of inadequacy results in a mindset that, that regards what we see as superior to what is unseen. And so we fall into the common sense <coughs> modality. It's true that the Lord will provide what is necessary for you to be victorious in whatever battle he leads you into. Let me make this statement again. It is true. God will provide what you need to be victorious in whatever battle he leads you into. Here's the question. Has he led you into that battle? We need to remember these things along the way. We need to ask that question. Second Chronicles tells us that Israel was up against a nation that was coming against them, and they inquired of the Lord. Shall we go up into battle? He goes, no, don't do it. It's a good thing they asked. Wouldn't you? I mean, if God's not on your side, uh, you're looking at death and destruction of many, many people. But they inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord repeatedly. And he said, shall we go up? Shall we go up? Shall we go up? He's like, nope, nope. Yep, go up. Yep, go ahead. Pursue, overtake, and recover is what he tells us. But is the battle yours to fight? I've seen a lot of people fret um, out of fear, of get, they get involved at something that is not their battle to fight. Because they never go to the Lord. You know, it's something that they feel inadequate. Well, guess what? You're going to be inadequate if the Lord is not with you in that battle. You're going to have fear that you don't have enough because you don't have enough. 
because the Lord is not your rear guard, you know? So inquire of the Lord. Is this something you even want me to fight? And then he'll tell you, and then go ahead and act in a manner. The exchange for inadequacy, inadequacy is what I said before. I'm sorry, I missed that slide. I have to miss that slide too. Should I be in this battle in the first place? <coughs> How many of you are rescuers and fixers? That one's just for you. I'm trying to alleviate a little bit of fear from your existence, okay? Does that even mind a fight? No. Okay, I'll trust you. Be there if needed, but it might not be your battle to fight. And then in your weakness, God's power is made perfect if it's your battle to fight. Disapproval. Uh, when the Philistine took, looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a boy. This is Goliath talking to David. Disapproval. You're going to face that. In the, in the face of disapproval, there is fear that people are not going to like you. The fear of man uh, is something that all of us engage in. And it's even more evident in today's culture. Not everyone is going to like you. Not, not everybody's going to like your decisions. Not everybody's, not everybody's going to agree with you and what you think you need to do with your life. First, go to the Lord. Then seek godly counsel and have them determine whether or not there's some wisdom in what you're choosing to do. Upon hearing from the Lord regarding a matter, you're going to be met with disapproval. Usually the people that are closest to you. Disapproval. Um, David's brother uh, he came out to kind of see what was going on with the whole Goliath thing. And David's, David's brother just chastised him right in the middle of, of everything that was going on. It's possible to avoid disapproval, though. It is. Um, do nothing great, say nothing truthful, and seek the approval of everybody. I don't think that's authentic. I don't think that's walking in, in truth. Consider Jesus. Everybody except the Father at some point in time, disapproved of Jesus. Even his disciples. Peter, I mean, think of them, you know. They were all just going along, and somewhere along the way, they, they came up with this idea, oh, man, I don't think that's a good idea, Jesus. Oh, thank you for your opinion, you know? <laughs> How do you exchange disapproval? Know your identity. Know your identity in Christ. Know your value, know your worth. Do you understand how valuable you are to the Lord? To the Lord, not others. A man bought his daughter a car at her birth. And when she graduated from college, he gave her the car that he purchased some 22 years earlier. And he said to the daughter, now I want you to take this to a pawn shop and I want you to see how much they'll give you for this car. So she drove it to the pawn shop and the pawn dealer said, I'll give you $500 for that car. She came back and she told her dad. Pawn guy said he was going to give me $500 for the car. He said, okay, now I want you to take it to a car dealership. And I want you to see how much they say the car is worth. And he took it to the car dealership, came back to her dad. Dad said, how much did they say? And the car, dealer, the car dealership said it's worth $1,500. He's like, okay, now I want you to take, us to take it to this classic car show in this parking lot of the mall. And I want you to ask somebody there how much they'll give you for that car. And she came back to her dad and she said, they want to give me $150,000 for that car. What's the message for all time? There are some people that will not see your value. You need to be in the right environment for people to see the value. And the more that you're around the Father, the more that you're around people of the kingdom, they see your value, your intrinsic value. Know your identity. And as a result of that, you can begin to believe what others say about you, that you have value beyond comparison. You know, if, if the true value of something is determined by what someone is willing to give for it, some of us need to reevaluate what we're worth. I need to remind myself of that. I need to remind myself of that. It's okay to feel rejected, to feel fear, sadness, and stay committed to the truth of your decision. You can still be afraid. You can still be a little fearful. You can still feel sad and stay committed to your decision. And then finally, the last one, disappointment. 
But the thing David had done displeased Yahweh. He's talking about Bathsheba. And if you don't know the story of Bathsheba, ultimately King David, he's there. He takes Bathsheba. He essentially rapes her. Um, then he has her husband murdered. She has a baby. It's a long, drawn-out story. You should read the Bible. There's some pretty wild stuff in there, okay? But ultimately, Dave, the thing that David did displeased Yahweh. God was disappointed, in essence, with David. And I would imagine all of us have been in this place. We know the truth, and then we act in a manner that contradicts what we know to be true. Right? The spirit of stupid jumps on us. Come on. Somebody? The spirit of stupid just jump, jumps on you. You know, and your right foot never gets converted. It's the last thing to get converted, your right foot, by the way. But it, it just jumps on you, and, and you're like, what in the world just happened? Oh my gosh, God, you're so disappointed in me. And you just want to invoke these imprecations against yourself over and over again. It's tempting to hide when fear, when a momentary lapse of reason becomes your true identity. It's, it's common to fear. Oh, I don't want to go out. I don't want to do anything. I'm going to be crushed. No, fear from disappointment is one of the most paralyzing elements of this spirit of fear because it weighs us down. Regret shame, anxiety, remorse. I shouldn't have. Why did I? I could have done better. And But guess what? That, that is a spirit of religion. I shouldn't have done it. Forgive me. I'll try harder next time. That's a spirit of religion is what that is. You are forgiven. There, why is it hard for us to deal with? Because there's proof that we're not perfect. Just look in the mirror. It's like, I did that. I just did that. And I'm not perfect. No, you're not. You're flawless in the eyes of the Father, but you're not perfect. Which is always an opportunity to crawl back to the lap of the Father. And what does he say? Come on, you know this. Come here, sit in my lap. I have some things I want to tell you. I wouldn't change a thing about you. And I love you just the way you are. That's all the Father can say over and over and over again. But you have to be willing to get over this fear of disappointment, that you disappointed him. The exchange to the fear of disappointment is to do what we're going to have, we're going to do in class tonight. You admit, this is what I did. This is the agreement with the delusional idea that I had. You renounce it, meaning you speak out loud. I don't want to agree with that lie anymore. You say it out loud. We renounced underhanded ways, the Bible says. And then you confess the truth. Here's the truth. I may not be perfect, but I'm flawless before the Father. And he loves me just the way I am. Does he want to change you? Not in the sense that you imagine. He doesn't want to change you. What I think he desires to do for all of us is to have us be more of who he created us to be. Big difference. Big difference. So tonight, that's what I want you to talk about. I want you to talk about, you know, there's four things that we kind of went over. Is there fear of disappointing other people? Let me, let me jump back to that slide all the way so you can see what these are all about. Do you afraid when something unexpected happens? Are you fearful of something unexpected happening in your life to completely blow up the rest of your life? Like this whole mall shooting thing. I mean, people walk around in that. That's a reality, okay? Do you, are you afraid of being inadequate? You just don't have what it takes to get through it. Maybe the disapproval of other people is your motivation. I'm just afraid that they're not going to like me. And then finally, that they're disappointed. So just kind of examine that. I'm going to let kind of the leaders kind of take that to that next level with the groups themselves. Guys, you're going to go to room 204. Ladies, you're going to go to room 202. If it's your first time here, you're just going to stay put right where you are. We're going to have some leaders talk to you a little bit more and just kind of encourage you and get to know you a little bit better. And I just have a question. Is anybody here tonight willing to just say, you know what? I just, I'm under a spirit of fear right now. Anybody just want to raise their hand and just say, I need prayer? Yep, 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 yep. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for you guys, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we thank you um, that you have not forced fear. Where is it over here? Anybody? Come on. 
And you have not given us a spirit of fear. You've given, you've given her. Come on, let her, let her receive the spirit of power, love, and sound thought, sound mind. God, I pray, my brother, I pray that you'd remind him that he has not called him into a place of fear. Whatever circumstance is invading his thoughts right now, I pray right now that you would um, address him with ameliorate it, that you would take it away, that you would just remove it from him, that you would separate it out enough where it can be managed. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Father, I pray for my sister that whatever she's enduring, whatever she's going through, the uncertainty that may lie ahead, I pray that that fear would be removed right now. By your willingness to raise your hand, she lifted up a praise to you and the Spirit left. Just leave right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for my brother, Lord, and his boldness to just say, you know what? It's still, it's me. It's me and I need this. And his willingness, God, to raise his hand um, has now released the Spirit of fear from his life. Power, love, sound, prudent thought. That's what you receive in the name of Jesus. Bless, bless. Amen. Amen. Okay. Father, thank you for Daniela. I pray right now that you would instill in her her sense of value to you. That's what she needs more than anything. So it's fear of not being good enough, not doing enough. God, no, 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 no. She's sufficient. God, I pray right now that any type of fear, any type of worry, any type of doubt would just simply be um, just vapor to her right now. It would lift off of her and would go to the feet of Jesus for judgment. Pray that you give her that power that she has, that anointing that she has, and that clear, prudent thought would flow through her, her head. Thank you for my sister. God, I pray that um, you would remove any type of fear of doing the wrong thing. <laughs> doing the wrong thing. Making a mistake. No, not anymore. Not anymore because she hears from you. And she receives that power and love. The love of the Father. It may, may the love of the Father be real to you. And what he has for you. Amen. Anybody else? Guys, Chris? Yeah, one more. Thank you, Father, for Chris. Um, I remove the spirit of never being good enough. He's given you a new measuring stick for the rest of your life. It's a new compass, actually, is what he's kind of instilling to you. And I pray that he receives that compass. It always points true north. And he's going to adjust his life to go to him. Because he loves you. He loves you. Amen. Amen. Father, we seal up what's been done and said here. Thank you for these people who have been willing just to say, you know what? I don't want this anymore. I want to make the exchange. And God, they've done it. So let them walk out of here free. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.